This is a Stories to be Told podcast. Hi everyone and welcome to another Stories to be Told podcast. I'm Tracy D.W., founder and creator of Stories to be Told, an online multimedia educational hub aimed at engaging all learners from nine years and up interested in understanding more about the history of the British Empire, otherwise known as Britain's colonial past. How are you all? I hope you're safe and well. To all our new listeners, welcome and make yourself at home. And if you're a regular listener, welcome back. Here in the UK, it's coming up to the end of March and almost the start of British summertime when the clocks go forward. However, it's also a time when we remember the start of our first national lockdown due to the pandemic. Let's remember and continue to pay tribute to all those that we love and to those we have lost, whether we are able to be with them or not. Since the events of June 2020, which sparked global protests in the fight against racial injustice and inequality, I have wrestled with the subject of this particular podcast. Discussion about this figure and others like him continually ebbs and flows in and out of media discourse. Much of the narrative about this person has incited a lot of heated debate on the subject. Therefore, I decided to let the dust settle a little before attempting to take a look at exploring this figure and some of the wider issues around him. Who am I talking about? Edward Colston, the man whose statue was unceremoniously taken down in Bristol and hurled into the waters at Bristol docks, accrued much of his wealth from the transatlantic slave trade. However, Edward Colston was just one of many public figures who grew rich off the exploitation of others. There has also in recent years been much debate around another public figure who, two centuries after Colston, also grew wealthy due to exploitation during Britain's colonial era. Cecil John Rhodes While Edward's statue in Bristol has been taken down, Rhodes' statue still remains intact at Oriel College, Oxford University. Has Cecil Rhodes succeeded where Colston failed? Colston, like Rhodes, was an oppressor but also a philanthropist and a good deal of both their legacies came before as well as after their demise. At first, this could represent a conflict of interests, but benefaction was a common practice amongst the ruling classes and served as the social media of the day. If you were rich and powerful, it gave you status and validation amongst the community. But on the other hand, it also gave you political control to maintain the status quo of the class structure and social order. Colston and Rhodes both fit into this problematic mould where things evolve past their original intentions and in these cases shouldn't the good that they have done be acknowledged? Figures like Colston and Rhodes are central to a wider discussion about whether statutes of other well-known figures in British society should also be removed and also whether street names and landmarks that are reminiscent of Britain's colonial past should be renamed. Should we erase these relics of Britain's colonial past or alternatively, Should we keep these in our present for future reference? If we want to know and understand more about our colonial past, we cannot just erase it. What do we or should we know in order to make an informed decision about what should be erased or left to remain about the past? Do we simply pick and choose what to accept or reject? So what do we know about Edward Colston? Let's begin with some core knowledge. Born on the 2nd of November 1636 in Bristol, his father was a merchant, so it seemed inevitable 
that Edward would follow his example, and he did. He made his first voyage as a merchant in 1672, trading wine, fruit and textiles to European countries, and ten years later he became a member of the Society of Merchant Venturers, joining the Royal African Company in 1680. It was during this time that Edward became involved in the transatlantic slave trade, acting as deputy governor from 1689 to 90. It is reported that during his involvement with the Royal African Company, as many as 84,000 Africans were transported to North and South America and the Caribbean, and out of this number, around 19,000 died. Edward never married and never had any children. He passed on his estate to his nephew, also called Edward when he married in 1704. Edward Sr. then turned to politics after retiring from private trading in 1708 and became a Tory member of Parliament for Bristol, serving from 1710 to 1713. Prior to his death in 1721, Edward carried out several philanthropic activities, using his wealth to establish almshouses, hospitals and Anglican churches in Bristol, London and elsewhere. The Colston Society was set up not long after his death in 1726, and over the next 40 years, more societies were established, fundraisers such as the Dolphin Society, the Grateful Society and Anchor Society, which were charities that help the poor, vulnerable and especially the elderly today, which can be seen as honourable. Now, you know me. My perspective always wants to go a little deeper. I want to explore the idea of nature versus nurture. Were men like Colston inherently racist and evil, or could their actions be attributed to the times in which they lived? Products of their socio-political environment... I'd like to take a look at what events were happening and where had England explored and colonised during Edward Colston's lifetime, between 1636 and 1721. It was an era that marked England's preoccupation with its own unionisation process, as well as the start of its involvement with America and the Caribbean. We actually have to go back a little further in time to the Tudor period and King Henry VIII, who laid the foundations for exploration when he passed the Act of Supremacy in 1534, making himself head of the English Church and through the use of funds from the dissolution of the monasteries from 1536 to 41. Both acts enabled England to fortify its ports against foreign rivals and invest into a formidable navy. This new cash flow also enabled a new middle class to emerge with mercantile interests and Henry became the first English monarch to successfully declare himself as King of Ireland. However, by the time of the death of his daughter Elizabeth in 1603, marking the end of the Tudor period, exploration and colonial aspiration grew, while relationships with Ireland deteriorated rapidly. The beginning of the 1600s set the stage of rivalry for dominance of the seas between England with Portugal and Italy, who monopolised wealth from the Orient, and with Spain, who monopolised silver and gold imports from South America and wealth from the Caribbean. John Hawkins, who I'll talk about more in a future podcast and story publication, broke the Portuguese stronghold over Africa to the New World trade, with several expeditions transporting enslaved Africans to the Caribbean in the mid-1600s. 1603 marked the beginning of the Stuart monarchy and also a union between Scotland and England, bringing to an end Scottish loyalty to France and a renewed interest in Ireland. James I signed treaty with Spain in 1604, robbed Ireland of a major ally, resulting in the Irish gentry and ruling classes fleeing to other parts of Europe. The redistribution of Irish land 
encouraged Scottish and English Protestants to set up plantation systems there. James also encouraged the forming of chartered companies which could monopolise and utilise the wealth from trade with discovered lands. The most successful example of this was the English East Indies Company with strategic ports in Madras, 1639, and then called Bombay in 1641, and Calcutta in 1690, which was to have greater significance in the future. This was the established political and social culture that Edward Colston was born and raised into. As well as Ireland, England turned its attention to America with its first successful settlement in Virginia, where the London Virginia Company ignited a lucrative trade in tobacco farming. Tobacco plantations led to the cultivation of other cash crops, such as coffee and sugar, instigating a scramble for territory in the Caribbean by the Europeans. The 1640s saw the civil war in England and the rise of Cromwell, which undermined the interests of aristocrats who had established lucrative businesses across the Atlantic. Many royalists didn't favour a Cromwellian government either, and migrated to areas such as Plymouth and Massachusetts. However, under Cromwell, England's colonising aspirations continued with the first act of navigation, using the army and navy to play a power game against Spain, and at times France, with England finally securing Jamaica from the Spaniards in 1655. The Irish Rebellion in 1641 was answered in 1649 with a brutal English retaliation, resulting in a third of the Irish population becoming displaced, losing their land. By the time of the restoration of the monarchy with Charles II in 1660, and with the second act of navigation, England was extending its reach. This time into Africa, with the King's newly formed Royal African Company in 1665, of which Colston acted as Deputy Governor from 1689 to 90. Further cash flow to finance trading abroad and further expansion into foreign territories came through the Glorious Revolution with the descent of William of Orange and Queen Mary and the founding of the Bank of England in 1694. Before I close this episode, I'd like to leave you with some questions, as I always do, for further thought. Which places in Bristol are named after Edward Colston, which have been renamed and which have remained unchanged? Should we judge and paint figures like Rhodes and Colston with such broad brush strokes, or is it more complicated? Is it simply a matter of inherent racism or were they a product of the socio-political agenda that influenced Britain's colonial agenda? Have we all benefited, either directly or indirectly, from the actions of Colston and Rhodes? And if so, how? And should we be concentrating more on today's issues relating to exploitation, such as modern-day slavery and human trafficking? And should we change what we can and learn? from what we can't. If you like this podcast, stay on my website and check out my other podcasts relating to this episode, such as Constantinople 1453, a catalyst for European change, which provides further background to England's and Europe's early attempts at exploration and the possible reasons for this. Also, the Pink Map Project, The Ultimate Paradox, which is about Britain's dispute with Portugal over territorial rights in the African continent. Remember, you can also go to stories to be told for mini documentaries, alternative history illustrations and suggestions for biographies, historical places and timelines, all linked to the content of my work. And finally, don't forget what I call the heart and soul of the stories to be told movement my stories or poetic narratives that are also related to this episode, such as Knights at the Round Table, the Berlin Conference 1884 and Caribbean Rush. 
They're both available on the website in ebook, Kindle and paperback formats. Feel free to like, share and follow on Facebook and Instagram and visit the website to join our mailing list where you'll be updated with events, promotional offers and future releases. As always, it has been a pleasure and privilege to share my learning journey with you in this podcast and I encourage you to either begin or continue your own. History is a matter of fact or perspective. Thank you so much for listening again and I'll see you on the next page. Stay safe.